What is up everybody? I wanted to make a really quick video here about casting. I'm at the hotel right now in Bucharest, uh, ready to cast the CSGO major. Um, and so apologies for the janky setup, but I wanted to you know, release my first of many videos on just some, just like caster tips and approaches uh, to, to doing commentary things I've picked up over the years. Um, and of course, I've got those articles and there's lots of stuff I think that is in those that could be broken down into some pretty good videos. So here's number one. Um, one of the big things I think that's particularly difficult with Valorant is that it's a very fast game and there is simply too much to talk about. So you've got to be very selective and you have to do your due, due diligence in making sure that you are always adhering to some of the golden rules in terms of you know keeping the broadcast engaging. One of those golden rules that I think is the easiest to mess up in Valorant is this idea of staying connected to the action. So you can kind of think of it like this. When you're talking... There and you know there is something you know that you're the audio you know the 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 viewers are listening to you as well as the game and you're there to increase engagement. That's your job as a broadcaster is to make or allow for the viewers to be more engaged in what they're watching. Now, if you are talking about something that isn't relevant to what's happening on the screen, if the thing on the screen is actually the most important thing happening in the game. You've, you're doing a very bad job. Like you've, it's very jarring for the viewers because what they're seeing doesn't match up with what you're saying, and you're actually you're actually damaging their experience because in, in if you if you're not doing this balance correctly, what you're doing is a really important thing's happening in the game, but you're distracting them from it. So you're actually making their experience worse than it is. So you're actually actually removing value as opposed to adding value or even coming out kind of even. So. We want to pick those moments really well to talk about the future or the past because you can think of it like this we're either talking about the present we're talking about all the future or the past and if we want to stay connected to the game and to stay honest to honoring the game and what the viewer is seeing then we need to be talking about the present most of the time unless and we make these judgment calls what is happening on screen isn't that valuable so the most extreme and easy example is an eco round that's a foregone conclusion. In this instance, you have the space to talk about the future or the past if you want to. It can be what something that I like to usually talk about in these moments. If it's if it's a case that one team's you know coming out ahead, I like to effectively say this is what this team is doing that's working really well. This is what this team needs to adjust. This is the expected adjustments that this team needs to do to be able to do better and to to stop this other team from having that momentum because that team doesn't other team doesn't need to change anything. What they're doing is working. So we need to see a change and this is the change that I'm projecting based on my experience. And you can kind of invest the viewers in that change and make it about this you know the strategical narrative in that sense. Uh, something that I like to do. Um, or it's a moment for your, you know, for you guys to have some banter if you want and just really get the personality in there. You you get this chance to to do that. Again, you have to make the judgment calls. There are other moments when the action on screen is not super important to the outcome of the round. So for or, you know, for example, another instance is if the round's over. You know, if the round's over, then you don't have to do hindsight analysis at the end of the round. You know, you you, you could say anything that you wanted after the round's concluded. However, the round is about to start again. There's about to be a new round, and that's extremely important time to be talking about the setup. For, um, and so this brings me to, you know, once now we've sort of highlighted this kind of notion that we need to make sure that we're always doing the the game justice. If something important is happening, we need to be we need to be conscious of that. We need to be following that because that's what the viewers care about, the fans care about, the players care about. So let's talk about more of an, a structural approach that incorporates this idea and it also incorporates the idea of a play-by-play -play and a color commentator. So if it's very rigid, now again, casting is very fluid. If you have two pe uh, people that are very experienced and know each other really well and know the things that have to be said and can kind of pick up, the like they, they will always make sure that there's a framework that exists, a strategical framework and that everything they're talking about tactically fits within that. And they're making sure that all of the narratives and the threads you've opened, they're, they're all relating and you're kind of picking it up together, closing them together. You kind of are both aware of all of these storylines you're kind of juggling together. You know, it can be pretty organic and fluid between both of you, but from more, for an example's sake, a more structural approach 
to commentary for a color and a play-by-play. -play. If you're starting out and you're wondering, when should I be speaking? How do I kind of make sure that I'm obeying that rule that I'd mentioned about the kind of staying present with the game? That's that. Firstly, that's one of the biggest mistakes that I see happen, and I'm guilty of it myself because Valorant happens very quickly and it's very easy to do this. And sometimes we get replays jumping in our buy time, messing us up. But generally speaking, we want to make sure that we have time for to set the strategical narrative and then for the color to really fill that out and to have dedicated moments to fill that out. Dedicated moments for color to be speaking and for the play by play to, to step aside is the buy time, the end of round, at the end of the round, the playboy plane to shut up as quickly as possible so that the color has ch a chance to have a quick recap if they want it. And you don't get very much time there, but if you want to do it, that's the time that you can do it. But then you've got to be really careful as the color not to bleed that into to the buy time because now you're not giving yourself the time to actually set up the beginning of the next round. And the beginning of the round is like one of the most exciting and most awesome points because we rarely get this opportunity, which we're gonna, I'm gonna show you right here, which is this is the start like start of any, any game. Look, at the beginning, we already can see what is very likely to happen. It's gonna be a C split. How do we know that? Well, we got uh, two players towards C long, I believe, three towards, you know, grass. The spike is in a very committed position. It's a pistol. The pace is probably very high. They're sacrificing map control elsewhere on the map. We would typically see in a default so they can have quick control on a split towards the C site. So the C site split is the strategy. Now the strategy is to win the round with a C split. Now the ways in which that's executed, the way the players are distributed, the utility that's used, that's the tactical narrative. And then we have the ability to talk about what the other team's gonna do to maybe combat that. But as soon as you know the barriers go down, this is gonna be an opportunity for our color commentator to stop talking and to throw the, you know, pass the ball over to the play-by-play. -play. And you wanna give the play-by-play, -play, especially if you, you know, again, you should be looking at the minimap all the time. We have to be constantly predicting things. But if you expect the round will be quick, you need to give the play-by-play -play time. And I'll quickly make the point here that the play-by-play -play needs time because, um, the play-by-play -play needs time because the whole like delivery aspects of casting you know, kind of necessitates the, the ability to be able to kind of, you know, start at a pace and a volume and then have the opportunity to kind of build it up and, and play with your voice and play with, you know, what's going on on the screen. You don't want to get that hot throw or that dirty throw, as I like to call them, where you're just thrown into the action. People are already dying and you're already starting up here. If, if you're already starting like right up here, it's harder to make it sound good. And you're gonna, you might have too much intensity, generally speaking. But yeah, if we go if we go on now, the play is happening, and the play-by-play -play is doing the play-by-play -play thing, which is to kind of narrate the action as it's happening, and using you know various delivery methods to do that. And then eventually, you know, we're going to get an opportunity, which is here. This is the opportunity now for the color to possibly speak. And the reason for that is because we're in this position whereby there's a natural break to the action. And it may be a very small break, it may be undefined, they may be poking and prodding, but nothing super committed is gonna happen. So if you wanted to leave a pause, there are, there's a way to do that without like a direct throw for the color. Where, because sometimes the colors, because the colors can be looking at the minimap and the, and the color's gonna think, hmm, I don't think I have time to really make a point here. So I'd rather not say anything. But you as a play by play might not necessarily know that because the color could always say like, a few words, and that few words might be quite meaningful, but you know you don't necessarily 100% know for sure. So what you, there's so a method that you can use in your delivery is, is is a method whereby you know we're always doing our delivery the way we're speaking our words on a rhythm, just like music. And so that BPM, that beats per minute, is just like always kind of there, and you're on that tempo. And sometimes you can decide to like skip, but you're always hitting that tempo. And when you have breaks, natural breaks, because everything's a statement, you're still obeying the tempo and giving opportunities for the other guy to jump in there seamlessly. And that's kind of you know how we how we do this. You know you have that tempo, and this is like a, something that I learned from a very uh, early early point is when you have that tempo, it's really useful too when you are eliminating brain farts and these filler words. Because if you, or if you run yourself into a corner, because let's say you, I don't know, sometimes sometimes when you're casting and you're kind of doing this kind of, you know, talking in statements like this, you might actually kind of write yourself into a corner and, and the, the thing you're about to say is not gonna be grammatically correct. It's gonna sound really silly. 
And so what you can do is if ever you're trying to find words is you can just stop talking. And so long as you start talking again and you catch the beat, you're totally fine actually, you're so fine. Um, so this is a really good technique uh, to, to, feel, you know, to feel not rushed when you're doing your delivery. And again, if you have those natural breaks, this is actually something I learned from Joe Miller, like right when I was starting on, if you have those breaks, it allows your co-commentator to, to just jump in seamlessly and just pick it up. So that's a technique that you can use. Um, but yeah, so in this particular instance, there was this break, but it's a little bit undefined. You know, we're getting this reaction, but it's still this poking from scream and the play's still kind of happening. So in the, actually in this instance, it would have been the case that the play, the play would have brought the, the, the kind of intensity down with the delivery and then would just kind of leave it in that mid place and then maybe pick it back up again as scream and Nevera kind of go in for the brotherly retake of this site. Um, and so one quick point to make here as well uh, that I think that I think is worth making because we're going to have this play and then, then you know, the player play will complete it or go to the next round. But one thing that's worth mentioning is that uh, generally speaking, this is another kind of rule that we can think about. Generally speaking, when we're casting, the way that the game works, you have a team that's about to do something. They will do the thing. After the thing is done, there is a state of play which leaves one of the teams in advantage and one of the teams in disadvantage. Then there's a question. How does the team in disadvantage react to get back into advantage and gain back what they've lost? How does the team that has the advantage play that advantage to capitalize it into a round win? So these are the two like big questions because that's the, and that's the flow. The flow is set up for the action, action, conclusion of the action, reaction to the conclusion of the action by either team and then the next play happens like then then there's the setup of the next play and then it's the same thing all over again so this is like a general structure and we can understand that within that the color should be speaking specifically at certain moments to set things up somewhat specifically so if we if we now kind of just go into like a random round and maybe we'll like we'll just pick you know we'll just we'll talk about you know how this works and then we'll talk also about maybe a, a method that we can use to kind of um, help ourselves improve when we're kind of looking back at, at VODs and so on. Um, let's jump in over here. Let's see if we can catch the beginning of a round. Okay, let's go from here. Okay, so we've got the... Okay, so I'm just picking pistol rounds. Pistol rounds are probably like the worst thing I could pick, but um, I'll just jump ahead. But yeah. There's a lot of, like, as you get to know your pairing, there's so much that you both can do to really mix things up and to kind of take those stylistic decisions that will make you sound unique. And, okay, let's uh, let's go back even more to so see if we can catch the beginning of the round. My internet's really bad here. So, okie dokie. Oh, so this will be a perfect round. Okay, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Okay, perfect. So we're gonna see here that the initial setup is gonna to be towards that A site. That's where the initial kind of control play is gonna go, but we know it's a default given Sage and Omen's position for the attack. So we know that the pacing is gonna be fast right at the beginning, and then it's gonna slow down immediately afterwards because we have this set piece. There's like no way, this, this is a kind of really amazing tactical display actually from Liquid. This setup is really strong. So there's no way that this can this spot can be won. So we talked about the setup for the action. It's a setup for the A lobby play in which the color can really describe that at the beginning of the round. The play by play takes us through the action. Now we're at that point where one team has the advantage, it's the defenders, and we're gonna have to have a rotation. So this will be a natural spot to allow your color to really start to talk about how a team gets back in. And we could see actually, I missed it because I'm talking to you guys about casting, that the setup was there, or the objective was there to try to get that resin. And, and so that's one storyline. But now what's the next play? So as a play-by-play, -play, you know, you've really brought the pace down and the cast and the delivery, and you've allowed the play-by-play -play to really start to highlight what's going on. But as we get to a point in which play is going to start again, you have some opportunities to start talking and to start getting in there. The play, the color should already have made the biggest point at this at this moment because we need some headway for the play-by-play -play here to take uh, to take the advantage or to take the ball again so that they can narrate the action. So we get Yampi who gets that initial pick. So, and this is something where, you know, you're not full blown into the play just yet. So the play by play would have actually taken the ball 
as I mentioned, probably around at least around this point at latest, I would say, because you want to allow, again, as I mentioned, the play by play to have the option, especially because it's a creep. You know, they're creeping into the B main position. We know the operator's there. So we have that tension that the operator player is going to hit that shot or not hit that shot. And that we want to be on the edge of our seats. We want the, the pacing to be slow of the delivery for the play-by-play. -play, and then we want it to be kind of quiet on the volume because that's very suggestive of their creeping. And there's this tension because there's this operator around the corner. And then as the play actually happens, because now you've set that up, now you get your like your big moment. Oh, you know, he's connects a shot and then he's, and he's able to fall back. It's untradeable. Oh, it puts him at such a disadvantage. And then you kind of kind of bring it down a little bit. And now the color could have a moment in, in a natural pause to set up what is about to happen. And then we go back into the play-by-play -play again. So you'd have to, again, as, as the pairing, have this sense for how long you have to be able to speak as the color and the play-by-play -play -play, to be able to kind of have the back and forth and to have that kind of dynamic of setup versus having the space to do the delivery as the play-by-play. -play. Like set up by the color, space to do the delivery by the play-by-play -play, and find those natural breaks. And it's not always clear. That's part of the difficulty of casting. But you know, in terms of knowing when you should be speaking and when not, what you can do as, as a pairing is when you're kind of going over these these uh, these videos of maybe like you're just reviewing your VODs, what you can do is is you can try to figure out, okay, what, what would the round sound like if we did it perfectly? Like if I was gonna get maximum value out of what I know and how I could engage the viewers in my role as color, where do I get the maximum value in this round? If I, if I was to go back in this round right here and go back to the beginning, what would have been the perfect way to do this? And that that is, of course, you 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 know you won't be able to to always know perfectly how to do stuff because we can't tell the future. But you know when you're when you've watched a lot of games, like we probably all have. And you 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 know you get to an expert point of just watching the minimap and making these future predictions. You can do it in such a way where you're hedging. You're always because when we're talking in commentary, you, one of the another parts of it that's that's quite uh, that requires quite a bit of experience is being able to make everything sound kind of good and everything sound kind of possible so that you have the ability to go anywhere. And you're not shutting yourself in. You're not calling a play. Um, and giving people a false hope, you're, but you're always leaving the ability for there to be hope or for there to be a position where you can build some excitement around something that happens that's crazy um, because you never want to make it sound like anything could happen and anything could be crazy, but at the same time, you don't want to shut out that, that from being a possibility. So to do that, you actually have to be kind of careful in the way that you do things. I ran into this early as a commentator whereby I was you know, thinking, I was trying to build up moments too much and not just allowing them to happen and i was trying to suggest that things may happen which which wouldn't just because i thought that it would be exciting or i was worried that what if something crazy happens and i didn't set it up properly that's just kind of how it goes and you just need to use your experience to to cast in such a way that you have the ability should something crazy happen that you can do it justice if it does and you should be able to predict the likelihood of crazy things happening and that factors into how exciting it is, but it also factors in to, you know, you know, whether or not you deliver it correctly, because again, we can really mess up the delivery sometimes because we can't be perfect, but you'll get a better sense over time as you get better at predicting things. So with that said, I'm starting to go into a totally different topic here, but I hope that this was actually helpful uh, for those kind of up and coming casters who are looking for, you know, additional ways to improve themselves and are looking for additional ways to structure out the cast and, and as you hybridize, as I'd mentioned, you know, if you have an understanding as to like how you want to cast as a duo, how you want to cast around, what should you be saying and when, how do you want to set up the strategy and the tactics? When do you want to put banter in there? You know, how, do you like, do, do you both like getting energetic? Do you, you know, does one of you not want to be as energetic? Once you sort of iron out these preferences, you can go back to these, these VODs, like I said, and just work out what does a perfect cast sound like? And then go and do it, go and do what the perfect, like recast the round and do it in a way which is perfect because that will allow you to understand like how long would I have to actually make this point? If I was able to script it out, how long would I actually have to make this point? Because again, think of it like this. If, if, that, if you can do it like that in hindsight with a VOD, if you make the correct guesses and oftentimes when you get good at this job, you make a lot of really good guesses and you make a lot of really good hedges 
you're going to be in a position where you're going to get it right a lot of the time. So if that's the case and you have practice and what it sounds like to, to like, let's say, you know, you have the ability to speak as the caliph like seven seconds or you have that sense and you have to jam a point in in that seven seconds that is meaningful and then gives the space to the play-by-play -play to get back onto his thing then having the practice to do that or the awareness to do that is going to be really powerful and having the and you know you'll be able to kind of empower yourself by watching vods and by kind of practicing what is the perfect cast of this round sound like so it's something i haven't done in a very long time myself but it's something I'm certainly going to be doing in the future as I prepare more with Sean, uh, you know, assuming that we're going to get some more gigs together. Um, but yeah, I hope this was useful to all of you out there who are looking at casting as a skill set that you're looking to work on. Um, if there's any other particular things regarding casting or anything else that you'd like me to make videos of, please leave you know, requests in the in the description in the description in the comments below, and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.